All right, should I just use? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll click for you. Can you click for me? Okay, yes. all right. Okay, so where are we are now? All right, so what's this show? I will not happy. I'm sorry, I don't know how this is Okay, all right, so what this shows, this compares recessions. So we've had 11 recessions now since World War II. So that's basically all the recessions since the Great Depression. Each one of these lines represents one of those recessions. They're all stacked up. So this is the first month of the recession, and then going forward, we are now 39 months out since the start of the Great Recession. <laughs> this line, the dark line, is the Great Recession. So you can see, you know, this is, it's, oh, well, let me, let me put it this way. This is the Great Recession. This is the, the we started out sort of, Sort of easy, not too much job loss. Lehman Brothers hits right here. We go off a serious cliff. This is this represents jobs lost. This little this little jog back up right here is hiring for the 2010 census when we got half a million federal yeah. government workers on, and then we promptly let them go. Um, and then, but you can see here where we're you know we are starting to add jobs. We're coming up a little but we are still near the bottom of a very deep crater. And then to put this in a historical perspective, all of these other lines represent all of the other recessions. The last three recessions are labeled, so you can see how we compare to the 2001 recession, then the, the recession of the early 90s, and the recession of the early 80s. And then the other gray lines represent all the other recessions since the Great Depression. And so what you can see is that this recession that we have just weathered is outside the experience of anything this country has seen since the Great Depression. Right now, 39 months out, we are down a larger share of jobs than in any month of any prior recession barring this one. So we are, we're improving, this is the good news. <laughs> we are adding jobs now, we are coming out of this. But the, the hole that we're in is just, remains to, remains to be something that we just have not seen since the great war. Okay, next one, this, this will just gives us an idea of what level of growth we need to get us out of this. So this is the total number of jobs in the economy. You can see this is the um, this is this is over the 2000s. So you can see the early 2000s recession here, and then the expansion from 2002 to 2007, and then the Great Recession. So this line going up, that's how many jobs we should have created over this period. We need to add around 100,000 jobs every month just to tread water, just to keep up with the normal growth of the working age population. So this is where we should have been. And instead, we, we did this. So we are now around 7.3 million jobs below where we were when the recession started. And we should have added almost 4 million jobs over that period just to, just to tread water. So the gap in the labor market, what we need to get back to pre-recession unemployment rate is over 11 million jobs. So this is the situation that we're still in, and this is why I'm stunned. You hear people talk about these budget debates, President Obama's State of the Union address, like they, this, this sort of thing is just not even mentioned anymore. People are acting like the crisis is over and we have to move on to the next step. We have to start worrying about where things are going forward. We are still in a very serious crisis in the labor market. And <laughs> this, oh, and this is the other thing. We have seen improvements in the unemployment rate over the last year. The unemployment rate reached its peak at 10.1% in, uh, uh, in late 2009. Over this, and now it's at 8.8%. So we've seen improvements in the unemployment rate, but I'm gonna throw some, I'm gonna open a cold hose on that one too, because the uh, improvements in the unemployment rate are only good news, arguably, if the share of the population with a job has gone up. So, 
That's what this shows. This is the employment population ratio. This is the share of the working age population that has a job. And what you can see, again, this starts in 1990, so you can see the early 90s recession, the early 2000s recession, the Great Recession, wow. an unprecedented drop, and basically no improvement over the last year. It's not getting worse. We are not deteriorating anymore. But it's pretty, you know, it dropped and it's pretty much held steady. So how is that consistent with the improvement in the unemployment rate? It's because people have dropped out of the labor force altogether. And so let me sh show the next one. That's what this gets at. This is the labor force. To be counted in the labor force, you have to be officially counted in the labor force. You either have to have a job or not have a job but be actively seeking work and there's a ton of people, actually nearly five million, who if the labor force participation rate hadn't declined, would now be in the labor force. The labor force should be growing all the time, as we see it is. Instead of growing, that would be the line, it's a good normally. Instead of seeing it do that, it flattened off. The labor force right now is actually about half a million workers smaller than it was before the Great Recession started. Instead, it should be, if it had been growing normally, nearly five million workers bigger. So there are literally millions of workers sitting on the sidelines who either dropped out of the labor force or never entered it because jobs, they just realized jobs aren't plentiful, I'm not gonna find a job. And so this is, this is why we've seen those substantial improvements in the unemployment rate but we actually haven't seen a bigger share of the working age population get work. That's the disconnect there. Um, the problem with this is it doesn't just represent the sort of lost opportunities for these workers. It also means that when we really do start seeing robust jobs growth, these folks are gonna notice and are gonna start re-entering as job seekers. So even when we really start seeing job growth pick up in a really strong way, it's starting to do that now, and when it gets growing even more strongly, it's still not going to get much easier for the pool of unemployed to find work because there's the, the, as these folks enter, it's going to keep competition high. Uh -huh. it's a, that's a good question. We don't know much about what they are doing, who they are, but here's, the, here's sort of the examples. There are people, there are um, people who, it's not retirees, it's not people dropping out of the, the labor force participation rate of older workers is actually rising right now. So it's not older workers, but it's people who got discouraged and dropped out of the labor force. They just said, I'm not on every door in this town 10 times. I'm not going back until I see some hope that I'll find a job. It will be, um, you know, somebody who took who dropped out of the labor force in 2006 to take care of a new baby and in better times said, oh, I have a kindergartner now, I'm gonna go back. And they're just not gonna go back yet because they realize there's nothing for them. There are young graduates who, who decided to stay in school and get, more, and get more education, although interestingly, that's not happening. There's this idea out there that young workers are able to shelter in school, but enrollment rates actually haven't risen more than what you would expect given the long-term increase in enrollment rates, which I believe is the following scenario. You have kids with resources who are actually able to shelter in school. They can go get a master's degree to wait out the, the, the current job scene, but the majority of college students these days work while they're in college. The majority of college students need to have jobs to be in school and so when the rug of the labor market is pulled out from under them, they can't necessarily afford to stay in school. So I think those two things are balancing each other out. Just so I understand, when you talk about workers, is that full time? Is it above a certain number of hours a week? This represents everyone. This is so just- if it's 10 hours a week, if you have a job, it's going to be counted as working. That's right. Actually, I think it's, I think it's you had to have worked in order to be counted as employed in the household survey, you have to have worked for pay for I think it's two hours in the mm -hmm. reference room. So it, it isn't, it's not a huge, you basically you just have to be working for pay. 
The average hours right now of workers is around 35 hours a week. That's the, so that includes full time and then it gets brought down because there's a chunk of our workforce that's working part time. Right. Mm -hmm. how yeah. The, how does the, the military not at all. The, the, all of our, all of our, the surveys that you see, all the data I show is civilian employment and civilian, and they, they'll ask civilians um, whether or not you, it's civilian employment and unemployment. So basically, these surveys are, that I'm looking at, these national, the BLS surveys, they'll do civilian, non-institutional um, folks. So it also leaves out prisoners. Is the institute doing any research or you know, uh, tracking the military employment as it relates to this issue? I haven't done anything on that. We do they, there is good data on veterans. You can get veteran unemployment rates and then they, you can break it down by when those folks served. Um, but I haven't ever seen any good data on current military. I guess, for one thing, they're all, if you're current military and you're in the military, you're 100% you're, you're employed. So I guess we, you could count those and then dump them in as employed. But That's the, the, sort of the stereotype is that uh, kids from wealthy families go get master's degrees and kids from poor families go to the military. Mm -hmm. Is there any mm -hmm. evidence that that's true or not? So, I don't have any good yeah, so you can look at, I don't have any, yeah, I, I only know as much as you do. I, I haven't looked at it specifically. I think that your, that story is, there's, we know that there is, um, you are more likely to go to get a higher degree if your parents have a higher degree. Like there's definitely some of, lot less intergenerational mobility than I think America likes to think it has. And so that speaks to that, but I don't have deep, detail.